bench positions requiring Senate confirmation. At noon, they'll take votes on two amendments, the Vitter Amendment, which would eliminate some White House positions that many Republicans refer to as and the DeMint Amendment, which would provide for the continued Senate confirmation of the head of the Bureau of Justice Statistics. Live coverage of the Senate here on C-SPAN 2. The Senate will come to order. The chaplain, Dr. Barry Black, will lead the Senate in prayer. Let us pray. Eternal Savior, creator of the world, give us this day a sense of your majesty. Fill our lawmakers with faith in your power to help them solve the pressing problems of our time. Lord, enable them to meet their responsibilities with courage and optimism, looking always to you as a guardian and guide. When life's pressures overwhelm, give them patience and the joy of experiencing your peace and love. We pray in your great name. Amen. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> The clerk will read a communication to the Senate. Washington, D.C., June 23, 2011, to the Senate. On the provisions of Rule 1, Paragraph 3 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, I hereby appoint the Honorable Tom Udall, a senator from the state of New Mexico, to perform the duties of the chair, son Daniel K. Noway, President for temporary. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kaka. The Republican leader is recognized. I ask that further proceeding on the quorum call be dispensed with without objection. <laughs> People in my hometown of Louisville, Kentucky are still recovering this morning from a series of storms and possible tornadoes last night that inflicted considerable damage across the city, including at the historic Churchill Downs racetrack, home of the Kentucky Derby. More than 600 Louisvillians were without power early this morning after thousands lost power yesterday. The storms did their worst at Churchill Downs in South Louisville where there were reports of funnel clouds and some barns were destroyed, sending many horses running loose. In many parts of the city there are downed power lines. The storms also did considerable damage near my alma mater, the University of Louisville, and the Jeffersontown area. 
The National Weather Service plans uh, to be in Louisville today to survey the damage and determine if the city was indeed struck by tornadoes. And the town is bracing itself for another round of severe weather with severe thunderstorms, high winds, and even hail in the forecast for today. Luckily, it appears so far that only property was damaged and no lives were lost or people injured. The horses are all okay, too, uh, for that matter, which is extremely important to us in Kentucky. Uh, we're thinking of those who've been affected by these storms and will continue to keep a close eye on the city of Louisville and make sure people have everything they need to clean up and to rebuild. Now, Mr. President, on another matter. <clears throat> This morning, I'd like to address uh, what I view to be a worrisome development in connection with the ongoing debt limit talks. Uh, but first, I think it's important that we remind ourselves what the purpose of these talks is. From the very beginning, the goal has been clear, to come up with a serious and significant plan for reducing the deficit as a condition for any agreement to raise the limit. Without such a plan, we're told, America could very quickly face an economic calamity of historic proportions at a time when millions of Americans are still trying to recover from the last one. As one of the major credit agencies recently put it, the rating outlook of the U.S. will depend on the outcome of negotiations on deficit reduction. A credible agreement on substantial deficit reduction would support a continued stable outlook. Lack of such an agreement would prompt Moody's to change its outlook to negative on the AAA rating. <clears throat> now, Mr. President, this is, this is serious stuff, and many of us have been hoping for and working toward a serious bipartisan solution, a plan that would convince the American people the markets, and the world that America is capable of getting its fiscal house in order. And let's be clear about something else here. We all know what such a plan would look like. Everyone, including the President, knows that we cannot rein in our debt without a reform of long-term entitlements. Cannot be done. And everyone knows that any serious plan would have to be in the trillions to get the job done. That's why even the Democratic Chairman of the Budget Committee said this week that he wouldn't even support a plan that proposed to cut less than $4 trillion over the next 10, ten years. And that's also why it's so concerning <clears throat> to many of us that some have begun to suggest a different goal for these talks. Over the past several days, <clears throat> some have suggested in various news stories that the real goal of these talks is to devise a plan that satisfies one side by reducing the debt and satisfies the other side by raising taxes. The suggestion here is that all, this is all just some quid pro quo exercise between the two parties. This is a dangerous trend, and it is wrong. And I think it's important that we dispel it. The central issue in these talks, as every serious person knows, is our nation's massive deficit and debt and the disastrous long-term consequences for jobs and the economy that would result if we do absolutely nothing about it. We have this problem for one very understandable reason. The government spends too much. The way to solve it is to spend less. It's mystifying, really, that at the 11th hour, some would now propose tax hikes as a condition to any agreement. It's mystifying not only because of the absurdity of proposing a tax hike as a way to help the economy and create jobs, it's mystifying above all because we know quite well that a tax hike would never make it through Congress, not because of Republican opposition, but because of Republican and Democratic opposition. We've already had the votes to prove it. Six months ago, Democrats couldn't even muster enough votes to pass a tax, hack, a, a tax hike on upper-income Americans when they had 59 seats in the Senate. 59 seats in the Senate and a 40-seat majority in the House and a Democrat in the White House. Couldn't get that done six months ago. Less than two weeks later, right after that effort to raise uh, taxes that they couldn't get done, they voted almost four to one 
in favor of keeping the current tax rates in place. Now, Mr. President, that was when the Democrats had a huge majority in the Senate, a huge majority in the House, and the President of the United States. They couldn't raise taxes. So there's one of two things going on here. Either someone on the other side has forgotten that there's strong bipartisan, bipartisan opposition in Congress to raising taxes, or someone involved is acting in bad faith. We've known from the beginning that tax hikes would be a poison pill to any deficit reduction proposal. A poison pill to any deficit reduction proposal. Those who are proposing them now either know this or they need to realize it very quickly. And that's to say nothing of those who are now proposing more spending as a solution to our debt crisis. This isn't just mystifying, it's absolutely farcical. I mean, most Americans had to wonder if they were dreaming this morning when they saw this headline. Quote, Democrats call for new spending and U.S. debt deal. It's unbelievable. More spending as a solution to the debt crisis? What planet are they on? All of which gets at the larger issue in this whole debate. And I'm here referring to the continuing silence of the one person who matters most to its outcome. For weeks, lawmakers have worked around the clock to hammer out a plan that would help us avert a crisis we all know is coming. Remember Admiral Mullen, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, said when asked what our biggest national security threat was, he said, our debt. Erskine Bowles, Bill Clinton's chief of staff, co-chairman of the Deficit Reduction Commission, called it the most predictable crisis in American history. But we all know this crisis is coming. And knowing at some point the president will have to sign on to some solution. So it's worth asking. Where in the world has President Obama been for the last month? Where is he? What does he propose? What is he willing to do to reduce the debt and to avoid this crisis that's building on his watch? He's the one in charge. I think most Americans think it's about time he started acting like it. It's not enough for the president to step in front of a microphone every once in a while and say a few words that somebody hands him to say about the jobs situation and our economy. Americans want to see that he's actually doing something about it. What they see instead is more bad economic news every day, a gathering crisis that threatens to make current problems even worse, and a president who's either unwilling, unwilling, or unable to recognize that our nation's economy is in very serious trouble. He's the president. He needs to lead. He needs to show that he recognizes the problem. He needs to do something about it. We're not in the majority. We can't sign anything into law. That is the president's job. That's his job. Yet until now, he stood in the background. He's acted as if it's not his problem. Well, it is his problem. This is his problem to solve. America is waiting. I yield the floor. President, majority leader is recognized. Following any later remarks, 
So that will be in a period of morning business until 11.30 today, with the majority controlling the first half, Republicans controlling the final half. Following morning business, the Senate will resume consideration of the Presidential Appointment Efficiency and Streamlining Act, with 30 minutes of debate on the Vitter Amendment regarding czars and the Min Amendment regarding Bureau of Justice statistics. At approximately 12 p.m., there will be two roll call votes in relation to the Vitter and the Min Amendments. We're looking at that now. There's Member senators have a problem with two votes. We, all, we, all, we, we only have one. We don't have that worked out yet. We will notify all senators when we do. And we're going to very, very likely have a number of roll call votes right after the um, noon hour today, so starting around 2 o'clock. Some other votes are expected. Mr. President. For the last month or six weeks, the Vice President of the United States, Joe Biden, who served in this body for 36 years and who has been assigned by the President of the United States to work with people who have been assigned by me, Senator McConnell, the uh, Minority Leader in the House, and the Speaker, to meet with Senator Biden to work out problems that we have facing our country with this huge debt. Senator Biden has been working very, very hard on this. Numerous meetings with this group of people that we assigned. Progress has been made. Whether it's enough progress is the means to be seen. But, Mr. President, uh, the President of the United States gets up early every morning, gets an intelligence report about what's going on around the world. There's a lot of things going on around the world he has to keep his eye on, and that's an understatement. We've had many issues that have come about this last month that he's had to focus on. No one can suggest in any way the President is not engaged in what's going on in the country. He is briefed at least once a day by the Vice President as to these negotiations. And following that, almost every day he meets with his advisors as to what should be the next step. So I think it's unfair to, talk, to say things like, where is the President? I think it is fair to take a little look at history, Mr. President. When George Bush became president, following that time of eight years of President Clinton, he was given at his desk in the White House reports that showed there was about a $7 trillion surplus over the next 10 years. He had developed during the years of President Clinton, a number of things. One was the pay-go rules, and we made sure that if there was a new program that was paid for, if we couldn't do pay for it, then we would take some of the program, take the money that we used for that, to take care of the new program. It was a time of economic vibrancy in this country that we've never seen before. President Bush got rid of the pay-go rules and decided to do something very unique decided to do everything on credit, everything on credit. Two unfunded wars that are now approaching $2 trillion in cost, none of which was paid for, money that we borrowed from Saudi Arabia and China and other countries. We gave, through President Bush, huge tax cuts that have been aimed by most all writers around America and around the country to be unfair. Paraphrasing what some believe is the richest man in the world, Warren Buffett said it's really unfair that he pays less taxes percentage-wise than his secretary. So the $7 trillion surplus we had over 10 years, the Bush administration wiped that out with all these wars and paid for and all of these tax things and other things that were done. President Obama became president. There had been 8 million jobs lost. He found himself in a big hole. Now, I think one of the things we should do is stop denigrating the economy of our country. Is it vibrant and strong? Of course not. But it's improving. It's getting better. Not fast enough, not good enough, but it is improving. So for my friend to say 
my friend and my counterpart, the Republican leader, to say the only place that we can solve the problems of this country is just to basically cut domestic programs significantly. We know we're going to have to do a better job of balancing the budget because of the, the deck of cards uh, that were given to President Obama, and we're doing our very best to do that. But the one interesting thing that my friend failed to mention because he talked about the Bowles Simpson debt reduction program is they said, among other things, of course we have to make significant cuts in domestic discretionary spending in defense, in mandatory programs. They looked at some of the work we need to do with entitlements, but they also said there had to be something done with revenue. My friend ignores what they said about that. And the other thing that they said, that is Bowles Simpson, together with the people that were on that commission, the number of appointments I made to that commission, they said, yes, we need to do some cutting, but these next few years, we have to spend some money to create jobs. And we hear not a word from my Republican colleagues about creating jobs. The House of Representatives, all they do is flex their muscles on things that they want to eliminate. But the one thing they don't talk about is creating jobs. Not a word. Now, Mr. President, this week my Republican colleagues killed their fourth jobs bill this year. The proven Economic Development Administration reauthorization was common sense legislation with a proven track record of spurring innovation and hiring by private companies. Because for every dollar we spent as a government, seven dollars came back in return from the private sector. And they killed our fourth jobs bill this year. It seems the Republicans don't care about putting Americans back to work. They don't even pay lip service to the issue. Americans have said there they care more about creating jobs than anything else. In fact, yesterday, a junior senator from Tennessee, a Republican, said right here on the Senate floor that this effort to create and protect, as we did the last few years, 314,000 jobs was, quote, nothing of importance. That's a direct quote. I'm confident that 14 million Americans out of work today, including many from Tennessee and every other state in our country, would disagree with the senator from Tennessee. He also went on to say, this junior senator from Tennessee, I repeat, is a Republican, went on to say that this worthy legislation, our fourth jobs bill of this Congress, was nothing more than an attempt, quote, to kill time. So he said that it's an attempt to kill time. He went on also, I repeat, to say that it was unimportant. Republicans may consider job creation a waste of time, but Democrats disagree and Americans disagree. Democrats, Republicans, and independents alike. And we all, and we're not going to stop fighting for Americans back to work until we get our economy back on track. We can't solve our problems without helping jobs to be created. Congress has no more important task than creating jobs. There's no better way for us to spend our time. There's no issue more important than job development. This legislation, which again would have supported 314,000 jobs as it did the last five years, was an important part of that effort. But, Mr. President, don't take my word for it. The junior senator from Tennessee said this about the Economic Development Administration just two years ago. This is what he said prior to his saying that it was a waste of time. Prior to his saying that it wasn't of importance. Here's what he said. This is a direct quote less than two years ago. Quote, in the midst of an economic crisis, projects like these are just the kind of things that will renew confidence and reinvigorate private investment in the area. That's what he said, end of quote. He said he gave funds to protect jobs and support economic growth. Why then didn't he vote that way? No wonder the junior Republican senator from Tennessee had such high praise for the program. EDA investments over the last five years will support an estimated 7,000 jobs in Tennessee. 
but in spite of his previous support, he voted to kill this worthy legislation anyway. And he's not the only Republican whose words don't match their actions. His counterpart, senior senator from Tennessee, also a Republican, also supported the ADA and those 7,000 jobs once, did it before. He said an ADA grant would, quote, bring a much needed boost to the local economy, end of quote. A few days ago, he voted to kill the program. Last month, the junior senator from Tennessee, from Texas, I'm sorry, from Texas, also a Republican, said an EDA grant in his state, quote, would pave the way for the creation of new jobs, end of quote. He said it would, I quote, strengthen the region's economy, end of quote. EDA investments from the last five years are expected to support, support more than 18,000 jobs in Texas. Yet he voted to kill the bill. And the senior Republican senator from Oklahoma said he has been a long supporter of EDA programs. That's a direct quote. EDA investments from the last five years are expected to support more than 5,000 jobs in Oklahoma. He's such a big supporter. He was an original co-sponsor of his legislation that he voted to kill it. There are, these are only three of 23 Republican United States Senators who lauded the importance of this legislation and then voted against it. Nevada has been hit harder by this terrible recession than any other state. EDA investments from the last five years are responsible for creating almost 5,000 jobs in Nevada. The legislation Republicans killed this week could have created hundreds of thousands of more jobs all across America. So I take it very seriously when a Republican in the United States Senate says putting thousands of people to work is a waste of time. The real waste of time is this endless obstructionism by Republican senators. They waste the Senate's time when they put partisan politics into our economic recovery. Americans have told us time and time again, putting 14 million people back to work is their number one priority. Democrats share that priority. Obviously, the Republicans don't. Their goal is to change Medicare as we know it, to end it. Believe me, Mr. President, the thousands of Nevadans who are working today because of the EDA don't think our efforts to create jobs are nothing of importance, as Junior Senator from Tennessee said. In fact, we've heard from out-of-work people in Nevada and every other state in this great country that there's absolutely nothing more important than job creation. Would the Chair now announce morning business, please? Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. Under the previous order, the Senate will be in a period of morning business until 11.30 a.m., with senators permitted to speak therein for up to 10 minutes each, with the time equally divided and controlled between the two leaders or their designees, with the majority controlling the first half and the Republicans controlling the final half. Mr. President. The senator from Hawaii is recognized. Mr. President, I rise today to introduce the Native Culture, Language, and Access for Success in Schools Bill that we will call a Native Class. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent to display a chart with a picture that may be a little larger than normal. Without objection. As a former educator, I understand the critical role of education not just to the life of a young person, but also to the future of a culture and a community. For too long, the Native people of this country have lived with a substandard education system that lacks cultural relevance and is burdened with administrative challenges and severe underfunding. Three major reports by the federal government on Native education since 1928 have demonstrated little, if any, improvement in the education of Native people in the past 80 years. This ailing system has resulted in some of the worst education outcomes in the country. On average, in the states with the highest Native populations, the graduation rates for Native students are lower 
than the graduation rates for all other racial ethnic groups hovering well below 50 percent. We can no longer tolerate this, especially because our federal government has a unique trust obligation to provide a quality education to its native people. Native languages and cultures are the roots of all native peoples. And to okay, to cut these, those roots, is to inherently harm the native peoples. The comprehensive legislation I'm introducing today puts forth a new vision of native education, one that is grounded in culture, language, and local community control. The bill provides for many new access opportunities for tribes to be partners in their own education system and paves the way for innovative language and culture-based instruction programs. Additionally, it provides much stronger accountability by agencies to Native communities for the administration of their children's education. The provision of this bill are the result of consultation and input with a wide range of American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian stakeholders. The introduction of this bill is only the beginning of a dialogue about this new vision of Native education. We will continue to work with our Native stakeholders to improve this bill and ensure that it builds strong roots and meets the unique needs of our Native students. I urge my colleagues to join me in supporting the passage of this legislation. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that the text of the a bill be printed in the record. Without objection. And Mr. President, I, I introduced the College Life Act yesterday, which stands for College Literacy in Finance and Economics. My bill is a response to the dire need in our country for greater financial literacy among young adults. Financial literacy is an empowering skill. Those who have a sound understanding of personal finance and economics are better prepared for the pivotal moments in life where decisions about money must be made. For many of us, financial independence begins during our Im or immediately after college and brings with it new opportunities and challenges. As young adults, we make choices about purchasing a car and buying with credit cards instead of cash. From then on, financial choices increase in cost and magnitude. The financial decisions we make as young adults determine whether we go through life on sound financial footing. Given the tremendous importance of my and early childhood financial choices and actions, it is troubling how unprepared young adults are for these challenges. Too few students have opportunities to learn about personal finance or economics before they enter college. A recent survey by the Council for Economic Education found that only 21 states require students to take a class in economics as a requirement for graduation. Only 13 states require a course in personal finance. Furthermore, parents are often unreliable sources of financial education because many are financially illiterate themselves. Even as we acknowledge widespread financial liter illiteracy among young adults, we allow students in higher education to take on alarming levels of debt during college. Borrowing to pay for school has become the norm. Two out of every three students receive 
some type of financial aid. At for-profit colleges, 96% of students borrow to pay for school. When students graduate, they have significant debt, with the median debt level being over $23,000. Meanwhile, the average student credit card balance rose from around $1,400 in 2002 to $2,000 today. Given what we know about the lack of student financial literacy, this is not surprising. Mr. President, in the, the increase in federal educational lending and student debt can be interpreted positively. I'm happy to see young people going to college in numbers that I never imagined when I graduated from the University of Hawaii in 1952. For best and brightest college, uh, is still a stepping stone on their path to becoming uh, future leaders. However, for millions of others today, college simply and rightfully represents the opportunity for better lives for themselves and their families. But the rising cost of education is a reality that we must address. Mr. President, the College Life Act begins to address this void in young adult financial education. It would provide financial literacy counseling to all college students who take out federal educational loans when they begin and leave school. First disbursement of a student loan and departure from schools are two timely opportunities for young adults to learn the importance of responsible financial behavior without those lessons coming at their own expense. Financial Literacy Counseling under the College Life Act would teach the five financial education core competencies, and they are earning, spending, saving, borrowing, and protection. College Life Act financially, uh, Financial Literacy Counseling would complement existing loan counseling requirements. I want to thank Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee for joining me as a House sponsor of this bill. I also want to thank my colleague Senator Harkin for lending his expertise in the area of student debt in higher education, including at profit colleges. I call on my colleagues to join me in support of the College Life Act and other efforts to improve financial literacy in America. Mr. President, I also have a longer statement and ask the unanimous consent that it be printed in the record. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Mr. President, the Senator from Colorado is recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise today uh, to implore my colleagues and to implore the negotiators uh, that are working on this budget issue to come to a comprehensive solution uh, that meaningfully addresses uh, our deficit and our debt. Mr. President, if, you, if all you knew about our politics was what you see on the television at night, you would think that we were committed to an endless stream of invective, of name-calling, of division, that we had absolutely no interest or desire to solve the nation's problems or solve the nation's challenges, and you'd be right sort of to give up all hope that we could actually honor the heritage of our parents and our grandparents and make sure that we are not the first generation of Americans to leave less opportunity, not more, to our kids and our grandkids. That's what you might think if all you knew about our country was what you saw on the TV at night. Fortunately, I have had the privilege, as said everybody in this body, to travel my state and to learn that actually the American people are nowhere near as divided as Washington, D.C., or as what you see on the television at night. In fact, we share an awful lot in common in my state of Colorado, whether we're Republicans or Democrats, Independents, and part of that is because we're going through the worst coming out of the worst recession since the Great Depression. By the end of the discussion I was having during the campaign over the last couple of years, there were about four things that people thought might be a good idea. They thought it'd be good 
to have an economy in this country where median family income was actually rising instead of falling. That we were creating jobs in the United States instead of shipping them overseas. They thought it would be a good idea if our energy policy did not require us to send billions of dollars a week to the Persian Gulf to buy oil. They thought it would be a good idea, and as a former school superintendent I agree with them, a good idea if we were educating our kids for the 21st century. And they thought it would be a good idea if we actually were willing to make some hard choices to deal with our debt and our deficit. And there's a lot of disagreement around here that I don't really understand, but in Colorado, the way they would like us to do that is that they would like to see a comprehensive plan that materially addresses the problem. They know we can't solve it overnight, but they'd like to see us materially address the problem. They want to know that we're all in it together. They're not interested in the Washington game of whose ox is going to get gored. They want to know that we're all in it together, that all of us have something to contribute to solving this problem. They emphatically want it to be bipartisan, which is good because we have a divided Congress now and it needs to be bipartisan to get this work done. And the reason is that they don't trust either party's go-it-alone strategy on this. And they're, uh, they're right, I think, to believe that we're better off compromising on a set of comprehensive proposals than, than continuing to fight. I'd add a corollary to it, which is that whatever we do, better satisfy the capital markets that their paper is worth what they've paid for it. Because if they're unsatisfied, we're going to be in an interest rate environment that is going to make all of the discussions that we've had about cuts seem trivial in terms of its effect on our deficit and our debt. And then I come here and we have these phony conversations about solving the problem. We had a discussion, Mr. President, you'll remember, about whether we ought to shut the government down. And I did the math on the bid and the ask spread about, you know, that divided the two parties over whether we were going to shut the government down. And that math uh, equaled about four cents on the $20 meal at Applebee's. Be like you and me, Mr. President, fighting over that four cents because we couldn't figure out how to pay the bill. It would be like the city of Alamosa in my state, in the San Luis Valley, where my predecessor Ken Salazar came from. It would be like the mayor saying, we can't agree on $27,000, so we are going to shut the government down. We're not going to pick up your trash. We're not going to educate your kids. The American people should know that's what that debate was about. Now we come to the debt ceiling debate, where people are saying, we are not going to vote to raise the debt ceiling. And somebody in a town hall said to me the other day, Michael, don't you know that me and my neighbor are having to figure out how to pay as we go? We're having to figure out how to pull in our purse strings to make sure that we can afford uh, to do what we need to do. And I said, I absolutely agree with you. And they said, well, why aren't you guys showing the same restraint? And I said, we need to show the same restraint, but it's, that's not about the debt ceiling. The debt ceiling is about bills we've already incurred. It's not about cutting up your credit card. It would be great if it were. That's not what it's about. It's about saying, I got a cable bill this month, and I'm just not going to pay it. I got my mortgage this month, but I'm just not going to pay it. That's not fiscally responsible. In fact, you know what happens to people that do that? Their interest rates go up because lenders say to you, you're not a good risk because you didn't pay your mortgage on time. You're not a good risk because you didn't pay your cable bill on time. That's what our lenders are going to say to the federal government of the United States if we're willing to jeopardize the full faith and credit of the United States. It's just irresponsible, fiscally irresponsible, politically irresponsible for us to do that. Now, in this context, we are having a debate about dealing with the fact that we now have a $1.5 trillion deficit and a $15 trillion debt. By the way, I would settle on the debt ceiling at least this senator would settle for raising it just the amount that the Ryan plan would uh, increase our debt. I'd be happy to, the, the Ryan plan, w w which is the House Republican plan, raised the debt by about $5.4 trillion. Everybody over there voted for it. A lot of people here voted for it implicitly. Therefore, th they're suggesting the debt, the, 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 the debt ceiling ought to be raised by at least that amount, and I'd be happy to support that or co-sponsor that. But, what I really would like us to do is come together in a comprehensive way. Mike Johans from Nebraska and I circulated a letter on March 15th, Mr. President. I'd like to enter that into the record without objection. And we, we sent it around to people, and it was a letter to the President that said that specifically, quote, we hope 
that the discussion will include discretionary spending cuts, entitlement changes, and tax reform. A comprehensive plan. Sixty-four senators signed that letter. That's a majority, more than a majority of the Senate. It's more than the 60-vote threshold necessary to pass legislation around here. Majority of Republicans and a majority of Democrats recognizing what is blindingly obvious to the American people, which is that we need a comprehensive plan because the math doesn't work otherwise. And we need people at this point of goodwill to come together and say, we understand that we're not going to be able to solve this problem if we continue to fight with each other. We're not going to be able to solve this problem if we continue to pretend that there's some magical mathematics out there that allows us to solve the debt crisis based on political ideology rather than our working together. And people ask me sometimes what they can do to help with this discussion. And what I say to them is they ought to be holding the people in this body to the same standard that they hold our local officials back in Colorado, to that mayor in Alamosa, or a superintendent in Denver, who never in their wildest dreams would think that they were going to phony up the math and go back to people and say, sorry, we just couldn't make it work, so we're going to shut down, or sorry, we just couldn't make it work, so we're going to destroy our credit rating so that you're, you end up spending more money on interest instead of on the services that you care about. Our job is to fix this problem. It's not going to be easy. It's going to take people on both sides of the aisle to think differently about what's possible. My own view is that the Deficit and Debt Commission gave us a road map here. It was a bipartisan group. Uh, the final result got the vote of Dick Durbin, one of the most liberal members of the Democratic Party, uh, and one of the most conservative members of the Republican Party, Tom Coburn, signed on to a plan that said, let's take a quarter of it from discretionary spending, let's take a quarter of it from entitlements, Let's take a quarter of it in interest savings, and let's get a quarter from tax reform. That sounds about right to me. And if we could produce a plan here that satisfied the test that I mentioned earlier, and I could go back to the town halls in Colorado, I guarantee you that what people would say is, thank you for finally working together. Thank you for producing something that's credible. Let's now move on to the other business in this country to make sure that we can compete and win in the 21st century. So I would say that I... I hope to the extent that anybody is listening to the floor today uh, that they would think again about the importance of using this moment to try to create a comprehensive plan, to try to figure out what the compromises are. And I, for one, am happy to work with anybody on either side of the aisle to make sure we get this done. I see that the chairman of our budget committee is here, Mr. President, and I want to thank him uh, for his efforts on the Debt and Deficit Commission. Uh, and also for the work that he's been doing with the Gang of Six or Gang of Five, trying month after month after month for the last 18 months to produce a comprehensive plan that actually addresses the problems. With that, I yield the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, the Senator from North Dakota is recognized. I want to thank the Senator from Colorado for his remarks and for his leadership. Uh, he has been right on point with respect to what has to be done in this country to get the debt threat under control. And make no mistake, we do face a debt threat of ominous proportions. Yesterday, the Congressional Budget Office again warned us, debt crisis looms absent major policy changes. And if you go to the end of this article that was from the Associated Press, Mr. Andrew Taylor, respected writer, CBO says the debt increases the probability of a fiscal crisis in which investors lose faith in U.S. bonds and force policymakers to make drastic spending cuts or tax hikes. Mr. President, that is where we are headed if we do not respond. And it is going to require a bipartisan response, Republicans and Democrats, because Republicans control the House of Representatives, Democrats control the U.S. Senate, and there is a Democrat in the White House. So when Republicans, as they, I just heard on this floor, blame it all on the president, that's not going to work. That's not going to work. Because Republicans can block anything in this chamber, and Republicans control the House of Representatives. So guess what? They're going to have to join Democrats in being responsible. And being responsible means doing some things that are tough. 
Republicans and Democrats are going to have to do some things that are tough. Why? Because we're borrowing 40 cents of every dollar we spend. Mr. President, that cannot be continued much longer. Mr. President, if you look at the historic relationship between spending and revenue, here it is going back to 1950. The red line is the spending line. The green line is the revenue line. And what you see is spending as a share of national income is the highest it has been in 60 years. Revenue is the lowest it has been in 60 years. When I hear my Republican friends say this is just a spending problem, they've got it half right. It is in part a spending problem. Spending is the highest it's been in 60 years, or very close to it. But revenue is the lowest it's been in 60 years. So let's get real. Let's get honest. This is a spending problem and a revenue problem. It is the difference between the two that leads to record deficits and a debt that is spiraling out of control. Here's what the head of our armed forces said. The head of our armed forces, Admiral Mike Mullen, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, last year at about this time. Our national debt is our biggest national security threat. Colleagues, are you listening? Are you listening? We are moving at warp speed toward a fiscal crisis. Nobody can tell us when it will happen. What everyone is telling us is that it will happen. Mr. President, here's where we are. This is the gross debt of the United States. We're now, at the end of this year, going to be over 100% of our gross domestic product. That is going to be the gross debt of the United States, all the bills that we owe. And this line, this black line, is the 90% threshold line. Why does that matter? Because, Mr. President, we have just had the definitive economic study done on deficits and debt and economic growth. It was done by Professor Carmen Reinhart at the University of Maryland, no longer there, but she was at the University of Maryland, and Ken Rogoff at Harvard. Here's what they concluded. We examined the experiences of 44 countries spanning up to two centuries of data on central government debt, inflation, and growth. Our main finding is that across both advanced countries and emerging markets, high debt to GDP levels, gross debt of more than 90% are associated with notably lower growth outcomes for the future. So this isn't just about numbers on a page. This is about the future economic prospects of our nation. A failure to act will consign us to a more limited future. Fewer jobs, less economic growth, less, less economic activity, a weaker position for the United States and the world. That's where we are headed. And we have been warned repeatedly. Here's the S&P, the major rating agency, signals top credit rating is in danger, stoking political battle on deficits. U.S. warned on debt low. So, Mr. President, nobody in this chamber, nobody across the Capitol in the House of Representatives can claim they didn't know what was coming. We have been warned, and we have been warned repeatedly. What happens if we don't act and there is a reaction in the, in the, rate, the interest rate uh, environment for the United States debt? I'd remind my colleagues, a 1% increase in interest will add $1.3 trillion to the debt over the next 10 years. 1% change in interest will add $1.3 trillion dollars to the debt over the next 10 years. So people say, well, we're just not going to extend the debt. We're not going to extend the debt limit of the United States. You know what happens? The creditors say, oh, really? Well, we're not going to lend you more money then. You know what happens then? Interest rates go up in order to attract other lenders. 
And what happens? Every 1% increase in the interest rates adds $1.3 trillion to the debt in just 10 years. Here is the remarks of 10 of the previous chairs of the President's Council of Economic Advisors. Headline, Unsustainable Budget Threatens Nation. This is their conclusion. The top economic advisors to former presidents, Democrats and Republicans, the previous 10 unanimously said this. There are many issues on which we don't agree, yet we find ourselves in remarkable unanimity about the long-run federal budget deficit. It is a severe threat that calls for serious and prompt action. We all strongly support prompt consideration of the Fiscal Commission's proposals. The unsustainable long-run budget outlook is a growing threat to our well-being. Further stalemate and inaction would be irresponsible. Mr. President, I served on that commission. There were 18 of us. Eleven of us agreed to the recommendations. Five Democrats, five Republicans, and one Independent. That proposal would have reduced the debt from what it would otherwise be by over $4 trillion. Mr. President, five Democrats, five Republicans, and one Independent, 11 of the 18 agreed to support the recommendations. And we cut spending. We cut domestic non-defense spending. We cut defense spending. We took on the entitlements, and yes, we raised revenue by a trillion dollars over the next 10 years, not by raising tax rates. In fact, we cut tax rates, but we still got more revenue because we expanded the tax base by reducing tax expenditures that are now running $1.1 trillion a year. Over the next 10 years, the tax expenditures of this country are going to be $15 trillion. Let me repeat that. The tax expenditures in this country over the next 10 years, special loopholes, deductions, exclusions, all of the gimmicks that are in the code, $15 trillion. Mr. President, not only did the Fiscal Commission come up with a recommendation of about $4 trillion. Every other bipartisan group that has made a recommendation has called for debt reduction of about $4 trillion over the next 10 years from what it would otherwise be. The Fiscal Commission, the Bipartisan Policy Center, the American Enterprise Institute, the Center for American Progress, the Heritage Foundation, the Roosevelt Institute, all of them saying we need to get this debt down. Mr. President, here's where we're headed, according to the Congressional Budget Office. Now, this is not the gross debt. This is the publicly held debt. It's headed for 233% of the gross domestic product of the country if we fail to act. If instead we'd adopt the Commission proposal, you can see we'd actually work the debt down, the publicly held debt, to 30% of GDP. Mr. President, every part of the budget has to be scrutinized and has to generate savings. Here's what's happened to defense spending since 1997. It has gone straight up from $254 billion a year to $688 billion a year. Mr. President, Secretary of Defense Gates said this, the budget of the Pentagon almost doubled during the last decade but our capabilities didn't particularly expand. A lot of that money went into infrastructure and overhead and, frankly, I think a culture that had an open checkbook. Mr. President, I think he got it right. And when we look at this growing debt, where did it come from? Washington Post just had this report on May 1st. The biggest culprit by far has been an erosion of tax revenue 
triggered largely by two recessions and multiple rounds of tax cuts. Together, the economy and tax bills enacted under former President George Bush and to a lesser extent by President Obama wiped out $6.3 trillion in anticipated revenue. That's nearly half of the $12.7 trillion swing from projected surpluses to real debt. Mr. President, if we look back on the five times we've balanced the budget in the last 30 years, uh, 40 years, revenue has been close to 20% of GDP, 197 in 1969. 19.9 in 1998, 19.8 in 1999, 20.6 in 2000, 19.5 in 2001. Where's revenue today? 14.5% of GDP. And our friends across the aisle say it's only a spending problem? Let's get real. It is a spending problem and it is a revenue problem. Let's be honest with the American people. Mr. President, Martin Feldstein, the distinguished conservative economist, said this, cutting tax expenditures is really the best way to reduce government spending. Eliminating tax expenditures does not increase marginal tax rates or reduce the reward for saving, investment, or risk-taking. It would also increase overall economic efficiency by removing incentives that distort private spending decisions and eliminating or consolidating the large number of over, overlapping tax-based subsidies would also greatly simplify tax filing. In short, cutting tax expenditures is not at all like other ways of raising revenue. Mr. President, Mr. Bernanke, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, has said this, and I will conclude on this point. Acting now to develop a credible program to reduce future deficits would not only enhance economic growth and stability in the long run, but could also yield substantial near-term benefits in terms of lower long-term interest rates and increased consumer and business confidence. Mr. President, this is a defining moment for our country. A defining moment. We can either continue to run headlong toward a debt crisis, or we can join together, Republicans and Democrats, in a comprehensive plan to get our debt under control. That will require a comprehensive plan, one that addresses spending. Spending must be reduced, but it needs to be reduced when this economy is stronger. That's what every one of these bipartisan commissions has concluded. Yes, spending's got to be cut, but not right this minute. It's got to be part of a plan that assures it will be cut, and it's got to be every part of spending. Domestic discretionary spending, defense spending, yes, the entitlements have to be right-sized, and we've got to have additional revenue, given the fact, the simple fact, revenue is the lowest it has been in 60 years as a share of our GDP. Far lower than it has been in every one of the five years we've balanced the budget out of the last 40. Mr. President, I urge my colleagues on both sides, on both sides, now is the time for principled compromise. Now is the time to come together to put in, in place a plan that deals with this debt threat fundamentally and assuredly. We've got that opportunity. We should not let this opportunity slip by. I thank the chair and yield the floor.
Senator from